This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, <clears throat> Stink Tech, it's Monday, it's 4 p.m. That means it's Stink Tech Asia with Russell Liu. Welcome to the show, Russell. You've been down here plenty, and we'd love to see you. Welcome, and Nihao. Welcome. This Nihao is Ma. A, yeah, Wuhan Hao. Yeah, okay, all that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and Happy New Year, too. Yes, Happy New In Year. In the American sense. Yes, but we're coming close to the Chinese New Year, February 16th. Yeah, Shingen quite a little bit. I'll save that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, um, uh, Russell is an American lawyer, a Hawaii lawyer, practicing in Beijing and teaching in Beijing. And he comes back and forth, and we have these great moments where we discuss, you know, the sort of the cultural arbitrage between the two countries. And let me add that, uh, you know, I think in modern time, uh, we don't fully appreciate China. We get, we get fear about China, and we get China bashing about China, and we don't want to trade with China. We want to push China around. We are afraid China is pushing us around. It's, a, it's tense, and this administration is not doing a very good, good job at, at mediating that. And so it's important we understand where China is, uh, where it is economically, you know, politically, um, you know, in terms of diplomacy, and in terms of its global, what did you call it, Russell? Its position on the global grid, yes. very important. That's a good term. Okay, so Russell and I are gonna discuss that today. We're going to figure out where China is, regardless of what Donald Trump has to say about it, and where the U.S. is. And guess what? Also, we're going to talk about where Hawaii is, how Hawaii is affected by the sea change around the relationship uh, between China uh, and the U.S. And Joe. And before we start, maybe I just want to give one thought for everyone out there in our audience. Regardless of where you are, whether you like China, you don't like China, you don't understand it, or you do understand it, there's a saying that I always have to somebody is that, when 1.34 billion people in a herd move in one direction, you feel the wind. You feel the wind, and you're going to have to deal with that. So it's important that we understand uh, more about China, and especially this community. You know, Jay, I grew up here, uh, lived full time in China for 15 years, so I have a, a little different view. I'm not an expert because it changes every day, so quickly, so rapidly, and with so many people. Well, I, I think it's clear that China, in many ways, even on our own terms, is ahead of us. Uh, we had an interview with a young fellow who came from China a couple of years ago, went to Marinol School. Uh, his name is uh, M.J. Mao from Shanghai. And uh, he finished Marinol School. He went to the University of Wisconsin. He's Olympic swimming material. He's also into science and diplomacy and design. A very interesting interview, I thought. But here's, here's a kid who's completely, I shouldn't say kid, he's in college, but here's a kid who's, uh, you know, completely successful in whatever he touches. And we have to regard that. You know, it's like, you know, when I first visited China, I was blown away by what? By the energy of the place. Everybody's working at 10 times the speed that you see in Hawaii, or for that matter, on the mainland. Um, and you say to yourself, if, if this energy could be harnessed, into an economy, which it is being harnessed into an economy, it would be the most incredible economy on the face of the earth. And, and that is being played out right now. So I guess the question I put to you, Russell, is, um, you know, uh, China is recognizing its, its, its power, uh, its economic power and it, it, the power to deal diplomatically and on the global grid. Um, what can, what has the U.S. done to deal with that, to recognize it, to collaborate with it, to catch up with it, you know, to compete with it, and what has it not done? Well, you know, I think we take a step back, Jay, and just remember, you're dealing with a culture that's thousands of years old, a culture that has learned through many mistakes, developed itself, survived many things, survived wars, um, survived being colonized um, at one point, um, and yet being able to recognize through these lessons of how it's going to implement itself through its form of government, 
it's form of culture, it informs society. And you strategy. Know. And strategy. What well, comes up to a strategy incorporating all these elements, and that's what makes it very fascinating and unique. But I think as Americans, we can learn, you know, as you know, Jay, I've been there 15 years full time. Uh, I see things differently. I see what can work, I think would work here, although it's a different culture. But I, I think you're, you're right. I think, you know, everything, it has to be, there has to be a direction. And my concern is we're 2000. 18, uh, and as we go over some of what we talk about today, you know we're going to be overtaken by China in 2028. That's the that's the date. Uh, it will become the number one economy in the world, and for many Americans that might be frightening. But I think we shouldn't be frightened. But I think we should learn how that we need to maneuver because exactly. of the changes that will happen. They will happen with or without China because of technology, because of of, of, of different things. But we're going to have to understand what's happening. Uh, not only nationally, but I think uh, for us locally here in Honolulu. Well, what I was going to say, it's, it's, it has, it's the whole analysis of this, it's complex, the whole analysis is, has to be nuanced. You can't be either afraid or a bully. And unfortunately, our president, who doesn't read and in many ways doesn't think, and it was people around him and just do yes, man, <clears throat> the problem is he doesn't understand. So he gets in there, the first thing he does, you know, after inauguration a year ago, is he's bullying them or trying. The second thing he does is he puts his arm around Xi Jinping's shoulder and makes like they're best buddies. Neither of these is a nuanced approach. Um, fact is that Xi Jinping could, you know, think him, outthink him any day of the week and is outthinking him. And it isn't only Xi Jinping, it's all the people who, you know, run diplomacy and international business in China are outthinking Trump and therefore outthinking American policy and therefore this country. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the problem is that uh, they are inexorably moving ahead of us with that economy of theirs and that energy I, I saw on my first trip. Um, and we do not fully understand, recognize and have a, have a way of dealing with it. Um, we should be much more nuanced in our evaluation of that in the way as you said, with you know, de developing some way to address it. Um, unfortunately, we're way behind. Mm. And we're actually, in a funny way, we're more behind now than we were before Trump. Yeah. Yes, Shane, I think, I think you've raised a good point that we are behind, definitely behind. I think we're way behind the cue ball. But that doesn't mean that, that we can uh, be in a direction, that we can start moving in the right direction. You know, I think the first thing that hits me, Jay, is that we are a coach in the U.S., we seem to be a, govern, cover, a governance culture that's short term. The Chinese are long term. Now they have every five years, uh, they have a, a five year plan that they come up with and they chart out their goals, sort of like managed by objectives. We had that in the 70s and 80s. Well, the funny thing is that all that five year planning came out of Russia. It came out of the communist era. It came out of the notion that you can, you can make a plan and execute the plan and you force people in that container and so forth. And when it first started, it was, was really hard on people, and it, it couldn't possibly work if you force them into the plan. But more recently, the planning has been much better, more mm -hmm. sophisticated, and more effective. And furthermore, we have all found out, you know, uh, watching government, not only in Hawaii, but, in, in, you know, in the, in the nation, that you need a plan. Mm -hmm. You can't just, you know, swagger from one side to the other. You need a plan, and China understands that. That's right. And you know, it's interesting. I was Googling today just out of curiosity. Do we have a strategic plan for the United States? Is there something written? Not I couldn't a chance, find anything. Russell. Not a chance is written. I couldn't find anything. And then I, and then I read some legislative uh, reports, and we're talking, about, we're talking about really partisan politics. We're talking politics that's killing everything that, where we should be going. We're not talking about economy, building economy. We're talking about investigation of Russia. We're talking about protecting the president. We're talking about going after the Clinton Foundation. It's all politics. So, you know, we are not getting what, we're, what we should be having, a, a governance where we're having people uh, know that the government is doing something. We're addressing it. And, you know, it, it sh it's frightening because I read a report that was a, or a legislative report that three years ago that one of the things the Republican Party was doing was cutting down uh, uh, the, these uh, education spending. And again, um, you know, China has been in the opposite mode. They've understood what they, where they need to get to and how to do it. They understand that education is important. They understand building infrastructure is important, building 
capability. They're doing it while we watch. And as we watch, it's amazing. And despite all uh, Trump's, uh, you know, the campaign promises to rebuild the infrastructure of this country, not a nothing. In fact, you get the tax break is going to make it much harder to do that. So anyway, I want to cover three things if we have time. I hope we have time. Number one is, how are they doing right now? What is their plan right now? Um, and how will it affect the United States? And what should the United States do to engage with them? And let's give all those guys some advice today, Russell. Sure. Well, you know, it's interesting because their plan uh, for the last 20, 30 years was to uh, bring manufacturing to China, which they did. Uh, and that created jobs. That created an engine. Uh, and that brought in foreign direct investment where American companies were coming to China, German companies, French. The world was coming to China to, uh, to build capability, the manufacturing. And China realized that, that somewhere along the road that that that, that low-end manufacturing is not going to cut it. You're going to have to move up the curve, the value curve. So they came out with a policy a few years ago where they said, we're going to switch, we're changing tracks. From uh, low-end manufacturing, we now move into added value technology. Uh, we want innovation. So their plan is by 2020 to be a master of innovation uh, technology. And their plan is in 2050 to be number one in technology in the world. 2050? 2050, long term. So they're taking steps. But along the way, along, you know, with their, with their GDP that grows at 6.5% a year, the U.S. is 2.2. Um, where we're at now and where, where there'll be in 10 years, in 2020, China, based on that annual GDP, a conservative figure, they will be ahead of the U.S., period. Their GDP. And the, it's very interesting where they are now. Um, they're, the population uh, centers, they're about um, where the U.S. was in the 1940s. So think about the 1940s to 1970s, 80s, 2000s. It's a long way in a, a short time. It's a long way in a short time. But remember how that gap when the U.S. was urbanized, then people had purchasing power. So as that gap shrinks down, more people are moving to cities, which means that the purchasing power of the citizens will be truly greater. And um, so we're seeing that wealth is being spread in the, in well, the country. And then we're also seeing the one, uh, one road, one belt, one belt, one road. One, yes. Um, you know, that's, that's going to have a sort of almost unpredictably good effect on China because it's going to connect it up. It's going to make it a global power economically. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's part, I mean, the one road, one belt, one belt, one road. One Belt, One Road. One, one Belt, One Road initiative is part of a much larger e -E thought package. Yes. It's a thought package of being global, of being a leader in the global economy. That's what we're talking about. But, you know, Jay, i got to add to that. that, that that's reminiscent of, of their, their blueprint for domestic China, how they've created a, the supply network, the chain, and, and China through their rail system, through their high speed. Their, they've got the largest high speed rail in the world, okay? It's all about connecting. It's connecting. Yeah. So the next step is connecting the world. Yeah. And, and taking the history lessons, the, the Silk Road has been the key uh, to Lake China. Sure. And the maritime route that goes through Southeast Asia right. and around to the, the Indian and Ocean. That's why all the noise in the South China Sea, they want to control transportation and connection. I mean, even if they're being bullies about it, which they are. But, you know, um, the, the problem is, uh, is the possibility of overheating, you know? Because when you have a planned economy this way, you know, a five-year plan and all this, you know, we will do this. And uh, I mean, although they're a little more flexible than they used to be, they're still operating on the same we will do this notion. notion. So the risk there, which I think existed 10 years ago and still exists, mm -hmm. is the risk of overheating, mm -hmm. right? That, that, people talk about that risk even now. Um, so the question I put to you is, uh, what are the challenges that China has in reaching those goals? I mean, could it be that somewhere along the line, they're, they're going to overstep it, they're going to be overheating, and their economy will suffer? Well, I think, I think the unique aspect about the way the Chinese economy works is really run by the government. But, you know, we think in America, that's bad. Um, but go to Singapore. Singapore was basically a benevolent dictatorship, Lee Kuan Yew. And he ran the country, but he saw fit. You look at the book Tiger Mom, how the Chinese mother parents will, will kind of control, not control, but manage the child to make sure that they're on this right road. Now, that's how the government is. It's, it's the same culture. It's a cultural thing. It's a nuance. Yeah. So people will follow that. You know, You're not worried about overheating? I don't worry about overheating because the adjustments are there because they have a different governing system. For example, uh, China was very worried last year uh, because the capital outflows 
the investments that were made outside the China that were not good, that were draining uh, money out of the economy. So what they did is they clamped down, and a lot of the leading private companies um, are under scrutiny, uh, and they have made adjustments so that the regulations have been changed, so the outflow of capital is really scrutinized now. So the outbound investments that are being made, they have to be make sense with the Chinese national priority. Yeah. More and more, you know, the conversation among the people I know is uh, to question whether democracy still works the way we, you know, were taught that it worked back when we went to school. Uh, and certainly when you and I went to law school, democracy was the, you know, the cat's meow. Mm -hmm. Democracy in the American form. But now you begin to wonder and you hear, you know, thinking from really in many quarters about how a benevolent dictatorship Dictatorship is too hard a word, but you know, in that in that way, with a strong central government with a mm -hmm. strong group that that has a lot of discretion uh, and that is well motivated, you know, for the benefit of the country, um, maybe that's really the, the model that will prevail in the 21st century because mm -hmm. democracy right now doesn't look like it's doing all that well. You uh, know, I think that's a really good point, Jay. That really gets the crux of, of economics. It's the governance. It's the corporate governance, like a like a company. And I look at it this way: you know, um, we have a country where we value um, our freedom and liberty, which which is which is wonderful. Um, in China, maybe it's a little bit different because it's a Confucian society, and and people will follow the leader. What's best for a group of people, not individuals, because 1.34 billion people, it has to move. The herd has to move. So as long as the government's moving the herd in the right direction. Kids nowadays can can afford to have an iPhone. They they they, they go to they have their the living conditions is, is tremendously improved. Yeah. Uh, uh, all of these things add up to something that people think I can live with this. And I always give this example. Everybody asks me what's the difference between China with the government, so forth, and the U.S. Well, look at this way. It's like this. Imagine a 25-lane highway. That's China. Huge highway. Many lanes. As long as you don't get to the edges, the sensitive things, you can cut in and out, you can do many things. And the U.S. is more like a 10-lane highway. We come in a rule of law, a box, and you don't work out practical solutions. You're worrying about the law and the restrictions. And again, those restrictions create the rule of law, democracy, again. But you may not get the real, a very pragmatic approach. So when people in China talk about pragmatic approach, I think, that makes people in America scared because yeah. it's, it's a different approach. Yeah. It, there's a lot to move around. Yeah, you want a pragmatic approach? I'll give you a pragmatic approach. We're going to take a break. That's a pragmatic approach. We'll take a one-minute break, Russell Liu, and then we'll come back and we'll talk some more about the same subject. And we'll also find out what's going to happen here and what the U.S. can do about it, if anything. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Thank you. Living in this crazy world So caught up in the confusion Nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way. There's got to be solution. How to make a brighter day. What do we do? We've got to give a little love, have a little hope. Make this world a little better. So try a little more, more than ever before. Can you hear me? Nothing has changed. Russell Yu is still here. He's an American lawyer practicing in Beijing and teaching in Beijing for 15 years now. He is <coughs> exquisitely familiar with the, the comings and goings between Honolulu and the U.S. and China, as it has evolved in that period. Really remarkable. Uh, I hope you write a book on this one of these days. Anyway, so you know where, where is it going? they got a plan. The, the probability is that they will not meet a showstop kind of challenge, like an overheat challenge, and short of some global disaster, um, they'll keep on going down that track. They'll reach Europe. They'll connect on a global economic grid. Uh, they'll have all kinds of 
You know, there's an interesting distinction between hard power and soft power, and then the idea is the U.S. has been engaged in software, soft power policy, where China's power is usually harder. And so they're dealing with other countries. It's a little harder than ours is. Call it hard power. But they will prevail, I think, in many cases, short of any kind of war, just a little bullying here and there, a little pushing here and there, and economic pushing included. And, and they will achieve, you know, global economic supremacy. That's what is likely to happen. So, I mean, do you agree with that? And when do you think it'll happen? And what will be the fallout? What will be the implications of it? For them and for us. Mm -hmm. Well, you asked me when will it happen. That's going to happen in 2028, based on the annual GDP uh, of the U.S. What, and China. January 1st? Uh, somewhere along in, in 2020. <laughs> Mark my words. Probably at the end of 2027. Okay. And it might December be December 31st. Um, okay. <laughs> but but you raised some interesting points, Jay. We were just talking about the the two systems. You know, uh, you know, I, I view it because I'm a lawyer and I see how things are done. Um, I think the problem is that we have this rule of law society. Not a problem, but uh, we have everybody fits in this box. We do things a certain way, uh, and people along the way that know how to milk the process, as I would say it, make it more inefficient here, uh, and ends up the project being dead because the money's run out. Things get in courts, litigation, and you run things over, and at the end of the day... I was what? involved in a program three weeks ago, December 7th, it's a month ago, I guess, uh, at the university uh, called uh, um, Group Participation uh, in a Polarized Era. And it's all about the, the laws that were adopted after 1970, how they encourage and permit, um, you know, public participation. And uh, they, 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 they do not limit public participation. And people who want to participate, like activists uh, or self-interested groups, you know, have, have found ways to use those laws to stop progress. And how do we, what's the countervailing, what's the, the you know, the swing back? Uh, how do we fix that? And it's not an easy answer, and it, there may be no easy answer uh, in terms of creating a society which is efficient in getting things done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things that, that's important to getting efficient done, yes, we have a rule of society, recognize that, but I think... I think uh, what I would be very concerned about is that we come to uh, this crossroad where, um, yes, individual rights, I believe, are, are important. They're sacred. You know, um, I teach a U.S. constitutional law class there, and, and uh, it, it, people understand and they agree. It's, in the U.S., we have the best system, democracy for individual rights. But along the way, that we've got to recognize that, that with these rights also comes a responsibility, responsibility of leaders to understand you need to put aside partisan things. You need to think about what is good for the community and the people. Uh, and I, I believe that China understands that. Um, do, you, do you believe the leaders in China have in, in their mind uh, the wish to help all the people? I mean, a sincere, genuine, non-political, um, eleemosynary, you know, common good kind of wish? Or well, I, is it less pure than that? Well, I, I can't really say because I'm not in the in political structure in China. But my observation, I can point out that from what I see is that because of the Internet, there's much more open transparency, social media in China, that I believe that it keeps everybody in track um, uh, because they have a one-party system. And I think um, the government does realize that it can be in jeopardy because of its past history in China. Things can happen very quickly overnight. That being said, I think that, I think that people are more or less on one page. Uh, uh, they're on the same page. Um, that they realize they have to make a better economy. But, you know, it's like this. When you're winning by a couple of touchdowns, you have an attitude. You have a winning attitude, Jay, and you want to further that, you know. So I think um, that's where they're at. They're, they're, they're winning the game. Mm. They're winning the touchdowns. And what do like they behind. think of the U.S.? Well, what, what do they think of the troubles we're having with our president? Well, I think, I think, I think they're amazed at, at what's going on in the U.S., where everything is too open, uh, maybe too transparent. Uh, and, and people aren't looking into the wisdom of, of, of being long-term, and everybody's fighting for uh, this uh, power thing. And you know what it reminds them of? It re uh, one Chinese expert reminds them, this looks like when China had the Cultural Revolution. You know, I was just going to say that. It's internal. You know, I heard there was a Chinese, uh, Chinese visitor to Hawaii, and um, he was uh, speaking about the, com the comparison that you and I are making. And uh, he's talking about the history of China in recent years. <coughs> and he said, you know, we had our cultural revolution 
1979. It was very hard on people. Mm -hmm. Now you are having yours. That's right. What an interesting thought that it, is. And as an American in China, when I'm thinking about the U.S., I'm thinking the big question is, who are we as Americans? You know, the demographic uh, changes, the ethnicity change, is it all happening in the U.S.? Uh, there's more Spanish-speaking uh, culture, uh, and, and we've had that event in Charlottesville, and, and we're having people giving the white power sign in, in uh, uh, President Trump's, uh, one of his aides, and it, it's, it's shocking to the Chinese that this goes on. So they don't think it should go on. They think government should step in and stop government it. Government should stop it. Government yeah. should stop it because, yeah. you know, that this leads to uh, so much uh, disunity that the model, the platform, the government, business, it comes to a halt. So paint me a picture of China, you know, in five years. What are we gonna What are we gonna see here? Um, how How is the economic, you know? success going to play out to the men on the street to the country and to the way the country relates to other places well, I think I think there's two ways to look at it one is the domestic what's going to happen domestically and the other is what are they doing so globally are they making an impact where are they and I think domestically you know that was part of the mission for the last uh, 10 years they they've um, uh, they've got the technology they built up their their logistics they they built up their transportation system so they're the largest, uh, uh, have, the largest uh, network of rail in, in anywhere in the globe. Um, things are accessible. So there is less of an issue of geographically where you are. You can't get things now. You can get things wherever you're in China. Number two, they've moved into innovation. So they're coming up with their own leaders, you know, in technology. Phones, look at Lenovo. Um, I just bought a recent Lenovo computer, uh, and you couldn't tell that, that this was a Chinese company. You know, fantastic. Well, I mean, they're certainly competitive, and um, I think they learn from us. Uh, but then they, uh, they're they past the point of having to learn from us because they can learn intrinsically. Right. But let me ask you the last question, Russell. So, you know, this is hard for us. And we, right now we're in a low point of our national development, I think it's clear. Um, what do we do? I mean, if, if you were president mm -hmm. or secretary of state or a combination, um, what do we do to address this? Um, because they're competing with us. They're not going to stop competing with us. They're going to get on top. Um, you know, I remember there was, there was a chapter on this issue in Simon Winchester's book, Pacific, uh, where he explained that the power had changed in the Pacific, that China was the power. And, and the message essentially was, get used to it. It's changed. So even assuming that's correct, what do we do to accept it, to deal with it, to do better competition with it? What do we do? Well, I think, first of all, I think, I think this is a good soul searching for the country. And uh, again, and I'm going to talk about the local community here. I think, yes, we have to accept it. But I have a saying that the Marines will say, adapt, improvise, and overcome. And, and we need to adapt. We need to adapt to that there's changes. We need to adapt it. And I believe, being in China 15 years, my, my personal opinion is that China has surpassed the U.S., although it has not in terms of uh, GDP per capita, but it will soon. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, it's on this uh, trajectory where you can't stop it. Okay, it, let's assume all that for a minute. You say adapt. That's a hard one, because inherent in this conversation, you say adapt, you mean, you know, lay back and enjoy it, because you don't have a choice. But um, what kind of adaptation are you talking about? Well, for example, uh, I think, I think the, the adaptation means that you've got tons of Chinese students coming to the U.S., for example. Good, okay. We, we have to adapt to, to a changing environment. We have to adapt to the fact that, um, that one of the most important priorities that we have neglected in the U.S. is we need to ramp our educational services. We need to move up the STEM, science, technology, engineering, uh, and mathematics. We need to get up the curve. Um, we need to understand that there's the internet. So it, what is happening is that no so matter, we have to we have to look out. We have to look out because the internet has changed and, everything. And we have to study Mandarin too. I mean, I, we had a show today about Mary Knowles School and how they have an immersion class for young kids teaching them Mandarin right here. The first one in Hawaii. First one. It's really that's shocking. It's the first one. Um, you know, I, I think what I hear you saying because we're coming to the end of our time. I wish we had more time. Um, that we have to adapt means we have to be more like them. 
Uh, we have to think globally. We have it, to have a plan. Work. We have to send our people out to the four corners of the earth to learn and do influence and do economics, which we are not doing. Uh, perhaps in the same way we're doing, we were doing after the Second World War, you know, the whole Marshall Plan extension mm -hmm. there. Uh, we're not doing that so much. The multinationals maybe, but th that's not the same thing. And so I think what I hear, you can tell me yes or no, I think what I hear you saying is we have to learn from them at this point. We have to follow what they're doing. We have to... Mm -hmm. Um, we have to extend ourselves, perhaps in a similar way that they are. Well, we have to suck from pride, first of all. Second of all, it reminds me of, of uh, my doctor here at Queens, um, and he said his son was uh, at John Hopkins University, and I think he's in engineering or something, and he said that, you know what, half the class were from mainland China, and they're learning. He says he's, he's learning culture, he's adapting. That's part of it, you know. And, and now let's get back quickly to the, our local community. And I, I think it's very essential because what I see here is that we've had this brain drain for many years. It's not going to come back. We're not creating industries. Why do kids go to school and why do they get advanced degrees? It, cause, because they use it to build a community. So what should we do? What we need to do, A, we need to bring in a lot of Chinese kids in, in STM, science, technology, engineering, Mathematics University, so our kids will learn to be global. Bring in kids from China. China, and that brings in relationships, number one. Number right. two, what we need to do, uh, if I was leader, I would start getting Mandarin really widespread. Number two, three, build the relationships. There are very well, few well, relationships between China and the U.S. What I think I hear you saying is we send our kids to China the same way China sends their kids to the United I, States. That's right. I just had two kids that went, to their, their sons of executives here, business people, they went to China for summer. And it changed the perspective of many things. Sure, but I think made what we them need, global people. Made them global, and one for of, life. I know one of them is already going to go planning to me. He's going to go back to do an internship there and wrap his language up. But this is what we need here. We need to change the the model here. We need to build platforms. Number one, because let's honestly, what I see is we have in this economy here. We built it too long on a labor economy. Labor economy has been out that 60s, 70s. It's no longer leveling, and we keep. We keep re-changing it to say construction. Uh, but we're not going to suggest we do technology. We have to. We have to build our knowledge. Our kids the will go to the state. Went through this whole kind of contortion over Act 221 throughout the, the 10 year period between 2000 and 2010, and roundly, soundly rejected that notion. They didn't want to support it at all. Well, and I and I feel that you know that was the issue then. And I agree with you totally. It is the issue now, and we better revisit we that We better issue. revisit that and, and look at what California is doing, the state of California. A couple years ago, I saw Governor Jerry Brown come up to Beijing, yeah, yeah. and he was talking about what he's going to do with China. And they built an office that really works. They have relationships. They're, they're exchanging um, uh, industries, and, and they're Tempest learning. Tempest Fugit. And, and, How do you say understand? time is of the essence in China? <coughs> I don't know if there's a saying. Time is always of the essence in China. Things are done quickly there, Jay. <laughs> Time is always of the essence. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much, Russell. We could do an hour of this. We but can do this anytime. Talk soon. Aloha. Aloha.